Good afternoon all and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Shields and I am a Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today we will be hearing from Ron Hacker and Brian Don't about managing invasive native scrub in Western New South Wales. Before we begin today's webinar, I will just take you through some housekeeping. So you should see the following control panel on your screen. If you don't, click on this orange arrow to display the control panel. Here you can choose your audio option as well as ask any questions you may have. You are in listen only mode, which means you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Today's presentation will be recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording within 24 hours. We will be answering any questions that you have sent through before today's webinar and also throughout the webinar, if you have any more questions, you can ask them by typing them into this questions box. We will then try and answer your question. I will start today's webinar with a quick poll. This helps us to gauge who is joining us today and to check that the program is working correctly. So I'll just launch that first poll now. The first poll question is, what is your industry role? Are you a sheep producer, a cattle producer, goat producer, a mixed species producer or an advisor? Please note, if you have trouble answering the poll question, you may need to exit full screen mode in order to be able to answer the poll. I can see we've got some responses coming in. There's been a few that have attended our webinars in the past. I've got 80% of votes, so I'll just give you a little bit longer and I'll close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. So now I can share those poll results with you all. So you can see that attending today's webinar, we have 11% sheep producers, 5% cattle producers, 5% goat producers, 26% mixed species producers, and the large majority, 53% are advisors. So I will now ask the second poll question. So just launching that second poll now, this is helping us to gauge what species of INS is an issue on your property. Is it turpentine, galvanised burr, hop bush or other? For those advisors among us, if you could select other or not respond, that would be great unless you have a specific species of INS that is an issue for your clients. I have 58% of votes. I'll just give it a little bit longer if you could all put your responses in. All right, I'll close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. So sharing that poll result with you all, the most dominant species of INS that is an issue in the region is turpentine at 50%, 6% for galvanised burr, 13% for hot bush and 31% for other. Thank you all for completing that poll. That lets us know that hopefully you can hear us and interact with today's webinar. I will now hand over to Ron and Brian. Ron Hacker was formerly the research leader, forest and rangeland ecosystems, and director of the Trangy Agricultural Research Centre with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. He retired in 2013 and has since undertaken a number of rangeland related consultancies, including writing much of the booklet, Managing Invasive Native Scrub, published by Local Land Services in 2019. Brian Don't is a Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services based in Cobar. Brian was a team member in 2007 for the project Managing Invasive Native Scrub to Rehabilitate Native Pastures and Open Woodlands, where his role was in investigating the use of fire to control INS. He spent two years researching the use of fire and other techniques to control INS. He has a keen interest in managing these species. 
Since returning to LLS in 2014, Ryan has been working on incentive projects, mainly TGP fencing and more recently managing our weeds funding program. Okay, Ron, I will now hand over to you as the presenter. So while we're just waiting to view Ron's screen, I'll thank you all for attending and we have a wealth of knowledge joining us today. Over to you, Ron. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope that you can hear me um, and that you can see the screen. Uh, so yes, the topic, uh, managing invasive native scrub uh, in Western New South Wales. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is just acknowledge the source of much of the material that uh, I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. It does come from this booklet that, uh, that Tanisha mentioned in the introduction, um, Managing Invasive Native Scrub, published by Western Local Land Services last year. Uh, and because there hasn't really been uh, any change in the situation between then and now, apart from the fact that uh, you folk out there are enjoying much better seasonal conditions, uh, there's not really anything much new to present. So most of the material is actually just a, a summation or summary uh, of what is in this book. If you don't have a copy of the book, then I'd strongly recommend that, uh, that you get one. I'm sure Tanisha can uh, simply send you the PDF um, because I'll be referring to it, um, you know, periodically through this presentation. Uh, and it, it is a good resource to have in, uh, in every station homestead. Okay, what uh, what is this thing called uh, called INS? Well, it was defined. Um, it's been defined many times, but the, the Central Western Western CMAs back in 2010 uh, defined it as uh, native woody plants that have regenerated thickly following disturbance uh, or encroached on vegetation communities where they previously didn't occur. Uh, and the current regulation that uh, guides the management of, uh, of INS in the Western Division, uh, the Land Management Native Vegetation Code of 2018, uh, which replaces uh, the regulation under the old Native Vegetation Act that was repealed in 2017, uh, actually lists 28 invasive, invasive native species uh, in the Western LLS region. And, and they're listed on page two of that book. So I won't uh, go through them, uh, but if you wish to see the complete list of 28, uh, then they're there in that book. Previously, of course, uh, we used to use the term woody weeds to describe uh, a subset of that 28 um, species, six of them, which were listed uh, for treatment under the Western Lands Act, but now, uh, the list has been greatly expanded and we talk about um, INS rather than woody weeds. So why is there a problem with, the, with INS? The early reports that came in from uh, explorers and, and early settlers right across southern Australia really uh, referred to uh, extensive areas of country that were quite open uh, and often they used this term gentleman's park referring to, to an English gentleman's park, of course, to describe the, the nature of the country. And Bill, Bill Gamage, in his uh, well-known book, The Biggest Estate on Earth, in, in 2012, collated a, a lot of these references, and it's surprising just uh, how extensive uh, across southern Australia that description of the, of the country was. There were patches of scrub, of course, but, uh, but much of it was open and, and it was maintained by, by Aboriginal burning. Now today, many of those areas are much more heavily timbered uh, with what we call in the Western Division now INS. And the main reasons for that um, include, firstly, the cessation of those traditional burning regimes, and also the removal of, of competitive perennial grasses by grazing, whether it be by livestock or feral or native animals. Those two factors are, are really the key um, to the, the the, the issue that we have with, with INS. Now, there may be other factors that have contributed. The reduction in rabbits since the 1950s may be a factor here because they do eat um, INS seedlings and therefore they may have um, 
acted as something of a control mechanism uh, in the absence of traditional burning regimes and, and perennial grass competition. Um, and that factor no longer operates. Some people uh, have also suggested that an increase in atmospheric CO2 may be responsible uh, for this increase. Because woody thickening, what we call INS, is not simply a Western Division problem, it's occurring all around the world. And therefore, people have looked to, to global influences like uh, the increase in, in CO2 uh, to explain this phenomenon. And, and there is some basis for that, because species which have the sort of um, metabolic pathways that shrubs have, uh, so-called C3 species, uh, do benefit from increased uh, atmospheric CO2. However, uh, I think some very respectable expert opinion in this field suggests that this is more of a, of a coincidence than a causal factor. It may have played some role, but uh, the burning and the competition from perennial grasses, I think, uh, are certainly um, the most important. Now, in encroachment of INS, of course, uh, is fundamentally dependent on what happens to new plants which are germinating and trying to establish uh, and are therefore susceptible to fire or, uh, or competition. And it's the interaction between those natural shrub control mechanisms and the seasonal patterns, which means that INS can actually be either a symptom or a cause of, of land degradation from a pastoral perspective. Uh, it's a symptom when the loss of perennial grasses allows shrub seedlings to survive and uh, it can be a cause when, when seasonal conditions allow shrub seedlings survival, especially over the first summer after, after germination, which is the critical time, despite the presence of perennial grasses, uh, provided fire is suppressed. So we can have a symptom of land degradation or we can have a cause and confusion about this, uh, I think in the past has led to a, a fair bit of misunderstanding between landholders and scientists about just exactly what the nature of the INS problem is. But it's important to realise that it, that it has that uh, paradoxical characteristic of, of potentially being symptom or potentially being cause. Now, typically, because these establishment events, of course, occur in, in high rainfall years, one, one can track the, um, the ingress of INS across the Western Division in terms of a, of a major or of a series of waves uh, where we have massive establishment events associated with a few high uh, or a few periods of high rainfall. Now, it's very likely that some establishment does occur uh, annually every year. But in these major events, we get a, a, a massive uh, establishment situation. And so we see these waves uh, of INS going across the landscape. Having said that, of course, some types, uh, some land types are more susceptible uh, to this issue than others. And in particular, the, the hard red country, so-called, on the Kobar Petty Plain, and uh, the soft red country, the sandier soils of the Northwest, are uh, particularly susceptible to it whereas uh, the Rosewood Bilar country and downs uh, are much less so. Now, that's sort of why we've got the problem, but just exactly what, what is the problem? Well, it, it's really summed up, I think, in, in this graph, which shows on, on the vertical axis, potential forage yield, from one down to, to zero, against the, the relative tree and shrub cover on, on the bottom axis from, from zero up to 100% of, of maximum shrub cover. And the relationship between forage yield and shrub cover follows this sort of a path. It's what's called a negative exponential curve. And it's very important that we understand that. What it means is that above quite a low level of, of shrub cover, we start to lose forage production rapidly. And we're down to quite low levels of forage production, even before the shrub cover is out to 100% of what's possible for that site. Now, it, it's, it's important to understand that, that that is the way it works, rather than just a linear decline like this. You can see that the, uh, <clears throat> the, the impact 
on uh, on forage production is is much more severe than what you would expect if it was just a proportional decrease with increasing cover. Uh, and there's no evidence anywhere in the literature to suggest that it that it operates in in this fashion here, where uh, forage production holds up reasonably well over quite a wide range of, of shrub covers and then just drops off the cliff. It doesn't work like that. It, it actually works in the way we've shown. Uh, so you're starting to get significant reductions uh, in forage production, even at relatively low levels of shrub cover. And that means that, that early intervention really is essential in order to preserve forage production and, and pastoral productivity because an obvious problem, once an obvious problem does exist, then forage yield may well have been already seriously reduced. So in terms of managing this problem, <coughs> the, the booklet suggests that there are three basic principles. The first is that uh, management of INS has got to be integrated into normal ongoing management. It's not a, a one-off type thing, it just has to be part of, of normal property management. The second is that we need to prioritise uh, the open areas and, and the maintenance of those in an open condition. Uh, and the third principle is that we need to prioritise the remaining areas uh, on the basis of the expected benefits and costs of treatment and also uh, the ease with which um, a particular area that is going to be treated can be incorporated uh, into the overall property management scheme. Fundamentally, we just have to stress, I think, that, that any permanent reduction in INS requires long-term management and there really is no one-off silver bullet solution to this problem. So looking at, at the first principle there, the integration of uh, INS management in, into ongoing property management, INS does need to be integrated with what you normally do on your property to maintain or promote perennial grasses by what we would uh, advertise as, as tactical grazing. I've mentioned the importance of competition from perennial grasses. So normal tactical grazing management to promote those uh, is an important part of overall INS management. Some of you may have done the, the tactical grazing short course uh, that's available from, uh, from DPI still, I think. Um, if you haven't, it may be worthwhile looking into uh, whether you could get one run in your area. Uh, but tactical grazing is part uh, of the overall property management. It also is going to involve control of total grazing pressure, of course, uh, with the TGP fencing, water point control, and so on, and then the treatment of whatever regrowth is occurring. And because the nature and timing of those activities are going to vary from property to property and paddock to paddock, there, there isn't any simple prescription that one can write out uh, as to how one goes about. Uh, managing the INS in a particular situation. The second principle uh, is give first priority to maintaining open areas. Now, as I've shown with that graph, open areas will provide the highest economic return because they have the highest biomass production and it's quickly reduced as, as uh, shrub cover increases. So it's important if they are open to maintain them in that state not only from a production point of view, but because the cost of maintenance uh, is much lower than the cost of treating um, heavily infested areas. Much better to maintain than it is to have to treat later on. And maintaining those open areas is gonna require careful monitoring to, to identify when new seedling cohorts establish, and particularly following seasonal conditions that, uh, that are favorable, such as uh, what has, have occurred uh, in the Western Division this year, uh, and particularly attention to treat those new cohorts while they're small, preferably less than, than 50 centimetres in height. The third principle um, of prioritising the remaining areas on the basis of expected benefits and costs is really going to require that you develop a plan of the property that shows the open areas and the areas affected by, by INS with, with notes on the, on the density and the species and the age structure uh, in those affected areas. 
it will mean, I think, that you need to make a decision as to whether those affected areas are going to be retained for grazing or whether you're going to look at the potential for them to, to be used for carbon credits. Um, and if they are retained for grazing, then the prioritising should, of course, first be the open areas, but then um, the treatment of the perimeters around current infestation so that we prevent spread into those uh, more open areas. Uh, a lower priority would be given to, to moderate to dense infestations and the lowest of all to, to large areas of dense INS. Now, I realise that there may be some local factors that could alter uh, those priorities, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, I think they stack up reasonably well. In terms of assessing the expected benefits and costs, this is, this is a, a difficult issue. Um, the, the booklet that I've referred to before does list um, the cost of, uh, of all of the uh, conventional uh, control methods, uh, not based on recent information, but based on previously published information that's simply been scaled up to, to $2,018. The lowest cost methods, of course, are, are fire, or if the uh, the infestation is sparse, the rubbing or spot herbicide treatment of individual plants. And the highest cost methods are, are blade ploughing and stick raking and broadacre herbicide, of course, and, and uh, chaining falls somewhere in the middle there. But, but it's obvious from the information in that book that all of the, these uh, methods uh, or the cost of all of those methods is quite variable uh, and depends a lot on the INS density. So it's really difficult to, to come up with any uh, estimate of the actual long-term treatment cost in a, in a particular situation. And because it is difficult to do that, one of the, the uh, options which is suggested in the booklet is that rather than trying to work out precisely the cost, uh, given there's a lot of uncertainty around costings, you may try to work out the, the present value, that is in, in 2020 dollars, uh, of the expected long-term benefits of a successful control program. And if you can work out those, those benefits discounted back to 2020 um, over a 10-year horizon or a 20-year horizon, then that's going to, to give you an, an indication of the maximum uh, present value of costs that you could sensibly invest in INX uh, management. And that may be a, a more useful way of approaching the issue of costing than trying to do um, the cost uh, calculations directly. Uh, anyway, there, there are examples of, of that given uh, again in the book. But what comes out of those examples uh, on pages 23 to 25 is that the, the benefit of successful treatment, not surprisingly, increases with the initial level of INS cover, because of course, as the initial level of, of cover increases, so the benefit of, of a successful treatment increases, but the, the, beyond about 20% relative cover, there's not a great deal uh, of, of increase in, in the economic benefit. And that's just a function of the shape of that curve that I showed you before. Now that might lead you to think, well, if we get more benefit by treating areas with higher cover, why don't we go and treat all the areas with higher cover first? Well, the problem is, of course, that, that the high levels of cover require more expensive treatments and the chances of success are probably lower uh, than for using cheaper methods that are applied to more open countries. So generally, despite that trend in, in the, the, the level of benefit with INS cover, it would still generally be preferable to treat the lower density areas first. And another point that comes out of uh, the analysis that's presented in the book is that if you extend the planning uh, frame, uh, the time frame from 10 years to 20 years, that increases the benefit of successful treatment, but it's particularly, um, it particularly increases it for open country. In other words, for maintaining open country open, rather than, than treating uh, areas which uh, require more expensive techniques. So again, maintaining open areas is a, is a particularly good strategy economically uh, in the long term. 
Now, just a few tips here um, for INS management derived from some experience or research experience in the Western Division and also from, from landholder experience. The first um, <coughs> is, that, is that treatment in autumn is often the most effective uh, for control of, of woody plants. Um, successive fires in autumn particularly are, are very effective in controlling coppicing shrubs but of course it's almost impossible to obtain successive fires in autumn uh, in, in successive years uh, and it's therefore been suggested that uh, herbicide application at, at relatively low concentrations could be used to, to mimic a second fire. Now that uh, was the sort of line of thinking that was being being developed at about the time uh, serious research on, <coughs> on woody weeds stopped in the Western Division. So we don't have a lot of uh, research um, evidence to say that, that that really is a good way to go, but certainly uh, it, it's something that you might consider if you manage to get one autumn burn in. Um, in Mallee country, and I don't know whether any of uh, the audience are from Mallee country, but uh, the work that CSIRA did there uh, showed certainly that successive autumn fires uh, will eliminate most Mallee uh, in open Mallee country that grows spear grass. Uh, in Mallee dune fields, uh, those successive autumn fires generally aren't possible uh, because the porcupine grass simply doesn't accumulate enough biomass to, uh, quickly enough to allow for the second fire. Spring burning uh, in that Mallee country is less effective than autumn, uh, and it may in fact have the undesirable consequence of, of stimulating uh, Mallee seedling establishment. Uh, as with burning, chemical application is often more effective in autumn than in spring. Uh, and not surprisingly, plants are generally more susceptible to herbicide when they're actively growing and younger plants and coppices are more susceptible than older ones. If you're in a situation where you are spraying regrowth that's coming from established rootstocks rather than just young plants, uh, then it's recommended that you use the, the label rate for mature shrubs because those uh, plants regenerating from established rootstocks will be harder to kill than, uh, than young plants, which have no rootstock. Um, <clears throat> massive recruitment uh, accompanies high rainfall events, as I've said, and particularly uh, in autumn. But uh, these events, of course, also provide the opportunity for management burning. And it's important to, to note that seedlings of, of all INS species are destroyed by fire, regardless of whether the adults or the mature plants are, are resistant to fire or sprout um, successfully after fire, the seedlings are, are always destroyed by fire, which is why it's so important to, uh, to treat those uh, new cohorts when they're less than about 50 centimetres in height. Uh, those management burns are best carried out in autumn and spring, simply from a, a fire risk management perspective. Sometimes landholders uh, raise the, the objection that uh, germination of some species may be promoted by fire, and that can happen. But uh, where it's been observed, it's never widespread. There are usually just patches uh, of seedlings whose uh, germination has been stimulated and almost invariably those seedlings don't survive. When it comes to, uh, to chaining or raking, those sort of uh, major investments, uh, the wetter the better is probably not a bad rule of thumb. It was actually coined uh, decades ago when um, Briglay was being cleared in, in central Queensland and for chaining there, the wetter, you could, the wetter the ground was when you could get on it, uh, the better the result because you pull the plant out of the ground rather than simply breaking it off. And uh, the same thing will apply to, to chaining of INS in western New South Wales. There is some, uh, <coughs> some landholder experience uh, which suggests the time of year may be important in determining the effectiveness of chaining and uh, differences between winter and summer chaining for example. Uh, you might think uh, given the uh, 
uh, the general importance of, of autumn uh, as a time for, for treating uh, woody growth, that uh, the, the winter chaining may be more effective than, than the summer chaining, but there's no research evidence that I'm aware of to uh, make a judgment one way or the other there, but that is landholder experience. Uh, the stem injection of poplar box has been found to be effective uh, at any time of the year or under any soil moisture conditions. Goat grazing, if uh, that's going to be used or is applicable for, for control of uh, palatable woody, woody species, species palatable for goats, um, is, is, it is effective uh, in controlling those species, but it's most effective when it's heavy and when it's sustained, uh, and particularly if it can be heavy and sustained during drought. The, uh, the experience in the old DPI trial at Linwood uh, back in the, in the uh, early to mid 1990s was very much that if you took the goat grazing pressure off and gave the plants a chance to regenerate, uh, before you put it back again, that was not as effective as uh, simply maintaining heavy and sustained pressure. And of course, short term cropping, which is, is often put forward as the most economic means of uh, INS control, certainly can su uh, successfully restore grassland. Uh, there's plenty of examples, or there are examples of that, but it's most important that the post crop grazing management is good if you're going to. Uh, uh, realise the, the INS control benefits of short term cropping. I wanted to just <coughs> mention here a, a, a worst case scenario that it is possible to get into with, uh, with INS, and that's the situation in which uh, an undetected or an untreated establishment event produces uh, INS which is too dense for spot treatment and too small and, and supple to change, to, to chain rather. Uh, so what on earth do you do in that situation? This is the sort of thing that can arise through um, yeah, an episodic event like uh, a, a major uh, period of, of high rainfall, such as we've experienced in the Western Division uh, this year and, and may, may continue into next year. We could end up with, with a, an untreated establishment event which we, we don't really know what to do with. Um, so what, what are the options in, in this worst case scenario? One, uh, I think, is simply to consider the potential of the area to be used for carbon credits rather than grazing. Uh, you may need to simply leave the area uh, until the shrubs are, are big enough to chain. You may need, as part of your normal property management to control uh, total grazing pressure in order to allow build up of a fuel for burning. And that could be assisted by using uh, implements like the crocodile to uh, run some strips through the area uh, as an aid to increasing fuel uh, and possibly even seeding those strips with uh, something like, like oats just for the purpose of, of building up fuel for the fire. Um, there was uh, <coughs> an attempt to look at that uh, at Tinderi some years ago, and I think uh, Keith Francisco probably thought it wasn't too bad. Um, you may consider grazing the area with goats at high stocking rates or simply establishing it as a goat paddock, depending on the species of, of INS present. You may, may possibly consider establishing trap yards to pick up the goats that might be attracted onto that area and use that revenue to fund uh, more expensive treatments. Uh, you may consider a three-point linkage mounted mulcher for relatively small scale operations. Uh, I don't have any particular personal experience of these things, but they have been used in the Western Division. Um, and Brian, if uh, I won't bring you in just now, Brian, but uh, when I've finished, you might like to uh, make a comment about um, landholder experience with uh, three-point linkage mulch. Uh, you could consider chemical application using the weed seeker technology once uh, those weeds are, are standing out reasonably starkly against a, a dry um, pasture background. Uh, and that again, weed seeker technology, of course, being um, 
Beams Bay application where nozzles are uh, associated with um, photo sensors that can recognise green vegetation against the background uh, and just activate the spray nozzle when uh, the green vegetation is detected. Uh, there has been some experience of that in the, in the Western Division and Brian, you may care to comment on that later on as well. Uh, chopper rollers, just a, a large metal cylinder pulled with, with cleats uh, welded onto it, pulled behind a tractor, uh, has been used in, uh, in these difficult situations uh, more overseas than uh, in the Western Division, um, but could possibly be considered. Uh, and of course, again, there's uh, that potential for short-term cropping. So a worst case scenario is not without some options, but um, you know, it, it's, it, it's still uh, a difficult situation. Thinking in terms of uh, possible developments that uh, could occur in this space in the future, I, I'm sure some of you have been thinking in terms of aerial herbicide application. Uh, that has been developed uh, in Queensland fairly uh, extensively, but it not, has not yet um, been developed in, in New South Wales. Uh, I think Brian has looked into this and not found any example of its use. Um, and it may indeed have, have difficulties under the, uh, the restrictions that apply under that uh, land management native vegetation code because of the requirement to leave certain numbers of uh, plants, even of the target species uh, per hectare. Uh, and also herbicides have to be registered for aerial application and they're seeing, and particular types of aerial application and there doesn't seem to be a lot uh, registered in New South Wales at the present time. So it, it may be something that um, LLS perhaps should consider trying to uh, uh, put some effort into developing it in, in the future, but it certainly isn't there at this point uh, in New South Wales. And, and finally, uh, getting very futuristic, um, there are developments going on in robotics uh, with a particular machine called Swagbot that uh, is being developed by the Australian Centre for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney. Uh, we have some uh, video footage of that, which I'll ask uh, Tanisha to show um, at the end of uh, uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, I have seen this machine set up. The the video is not uh, a Western Division um, scene. It's actually spraying serrated tussock somewhere on the Monaro, I think. But I have seen uh, this machine set up to uh, spray. Um, uh, African box thorn uh, in, in somewhere, I think, in the Western Division or Western New South Wales anyway, and, and also uh, galvanised burr, but I couldn't find the, the video of, of that when I came to uh, look for it. So we just have uh, an example of it doing something else, but uh, you'll at least see where that sort of technology uh, is up to at the moment. Now, just before I, uh, I close my presentation, I just wanted to say a few things uh, briefly about the current situation in Western, in the Western Division where coming out of a drought, uh, you know, you've had a pretty good uh, autumn or late summer autumn rains this year and uh, a pretty good winter season, I understand. It's, it's really important now <coughs> to, to get out and, and monitor paddocks very carefully for the presence of shrub seedlings. Uh, at this stage, still hidden uh, in the pasture growth, and particularly paying attention to those areas that are, that are currently open. Uh, and then you might do uh, if the coming summer uh, is wet or dry. As I've said before, this first summer, if we have had a significant establishment event this autumn, or perhaps through the winter, um, the coming summer is going to be really critical in terms of determining what happens to that to that new cohort? If the summer is wet, uh, then those seedlings probably will survive uh, and they'll grow pretty rapidly. So you may need to consider then the possibility of a management burn in, in autumn, um, following autumn. Um, <coughs> sorry, in, in autumn 2021 or in the following spring. 
uh, for which you really need at least a thousand kgs of diameter per hectare to carry the fire. Uh, you would need to consider, I think, prioritising the areas for treatment as we uh, discussed earlier. Uh, and if you do end up in a worst case situation uh, where those seedlings do survive, um, then consider the options that <coughs> excuse me, I talked about earlier for that worst case situation. On the other hand, if, uh, if the summer is dry, then in areas where you if you have good, a good stand of perennial grass, I would simply sit tight and not worry too much. Uh, most of the seedlings will probably die, but uh, you'd need to inspect it again and see what's happened at the end of summer. Uh, and if you're in a poorly grassed area, which is simply just growing annual herbage, which is going to dry off quickly, uh, then you might consider if you really do have a significant establishment event using that uh, weed seeker technology to pick out seedlings among the dry pastures. Um, and in either case, um, <coughs> excuse me, prioritise areas uh, for treatment, uh, as we talked about earlier. And finally, I think um, it would be good to get hold of uh, this booklet, which was uh, published by Central West um, LLS in uh, 2014 and uh, is a revision of uh, a document uh, that was published by the Central West and Western CMAs in, in 2010. Uh, and it does con it contains detailed descriptions of, of management recommendations for a fair number of, of the individual species in that list of 28, not all of them, uh, but, a, but a useful number. So, um, if you don't have a copy of this book, but then uh, I'm sure Tanisha would be able to organise for the PDF to be sent, uh, as with the, the uh, as with the first one that I discussed. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to, to answer questions. Or Brian, maybe you'd like to comment on those couple of things that I threw over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, excellent presentation. Um, so yeah, just as you mentioned there about the booklets, um, I do. There should be hard copies of the uh, managing invasive native scrub in all of our local land services offices. Um, I know people would rather have a hard copy than uh, look at it on the computer. So yes, we do have a few of those around. So contact your local office, or uh, if they don't have any, get in touch with me, and we'll soon get some sent on. Um, yeah. So the mulching was one of the topics that you talked about, and um, again, once you get that booklet. Uh, if you have a look at the front cover, that's obviously a, a, an area that had been chained uh, previously. Uh, have a look on page three, and you'll see in the foreground um, that area was mulched, and you can see the uh, recovery of grasses. And in the background um, was an area that wasn't mulched. So there's the uh, standout difference with that the mulching did in that particular area. Again, it was uh, only a small area. It's not something that people would take on to do very large areas. It's uh, be a bit costly. Uh, the, the chaining you mentioned about the uh, wet versus dry. Um, I do get around and talk to a lot of landholders about their INS management. And look, I found in this certainly in this Cobar Penny Plain in the harder country, there's been some success with uh, chaining in the dry, um, given we probably have more dry periods than we do wet. And uh, in the past years, when there was uh, plants would have been suffering a fair bit with uh, stress, uh, I would have thought would have been a good opportunity to chain them because uh, the chance of survival after that would have been very low. And uh, the weed seeker was also mentioned. Look, it was uh, um, it's been trialled in a few areas. There's been some success with it. I think some of the uh, problems were that the cameras and now mind you I'm talking of ones that were developed uh, 10 years ago they had a little bit of a problem with distinguishing the green plant amongst other vegetation if there was a fair bit there uh, I'd assume that cameras have got better over the years and uh, it should be still uh, would be still a viable option I'd think at this stage but anyway that's uh, enough from me at this stage so yeah Ron back to you uh, yeah thanks Brian um... So maybe my uh, my use of the Queensland um, rule of thumb, the wetter the better, uh, doesn't actually apply in, in the Western Division, do you think? 
Oh, look, I'm. It may do. I, again, that's part of the problem, isn't it? If it's uh, uh, very wet, you're not going to get onto it, and by the time it does start to dry up enough for you to get uh, machinery on there, it, uh, yeah, maybe too late. I don't know. Again, yeah. it's just uh, landholders trying different things and letting us know. Like, you know, I'm I'm quite happy to go ahead and have a look at people's projects and see what they do. And again, if they keep them a small area and for trials, they're not going to go to a lot of expense. Um, yeah, and that's uh, that's basically what I've been doing is looking at people that have chained little patches in the wet and the dry. And look, haven't seen a lot in the uh, softer country, but I know it certainly worked well in the dry. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Queensland experience was simply about um, getting on the country as wet as you can in, in order to pull the, the uh, you know, the trees out of the ground rather than simply break them off. And, uh, so that, um, <clears throat> Yeah, maybe still relevant to, to larger, uh, you know, larger INS um, uh, stands in, uh, in Western New South Wales, I'm not sure. Sounds like we need a bit more local experience there. Now, Tanisha, uh, are you able to run that video clip? Yes, I will just bring that video up now for you all. While I'm bringing the video up, please remember we've got a few questions coming in. So if you have any questions, type them in the questions box and we'll answer them after we play this video. There is no sound on the video, so if you can't hear it, that's because there's no sound. Okay, thank you all for viewing that. I will now read out a few questions that have come through for Ron and Brian to answer. So the first question that we have had come through is, further developments were mentioned. What further new research is underway with new management tools? And if not, what opportunities are likely to be explored? Uh, look, I'll just uh, jump in there initially. Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of, of any formal research that uh, is currently underway uh, on INS in New South Wales. Um, that robotic stuff, uh, I think, is still a fair way from, uh, from any sort of commercial application. Uh, they're doing a lot of work to develop that sort of technology for, for more intensive industries uh, and more, you know, valuable in quotes, industries like, like horticulture, you know, intensive horticulture. So the pressure is going to be from that direction rather than from a rangeland direction. Um, Brian, you probably know more than I do at this stage about any work that's uh, ongoing in uh, or, or new work in uh, Western New South Wales. Yeah, probably not a lot of new stuff in 
New South Wales, but uh, I think you mentioned in your presentation about different uh, devices and techniques. There was a, um, a splatter gun has been developed. Uh, it's just an air-operated gun, you know, to uh, vehicle mounted just to uh, shoot granules out in difficult terrain. So that you know, it's a bit hard to uh, drive your four-wheel drive or um, quad bike to an area to put granules out around a plant. Um, there's this uh, splatter gun that's been developed. Um, yeah, so I'm not too sure if there's a, much more activities happening in New South Wales with new development at this stage. No, I, I, I'm not aware of it. The splatter gun uh, was developed in Queensland, um, particularly to just fire granulated herbicide in, into dense patches of prickly acacia, basically. Yeah, no, that's right. So uh, again, not too sure how that would work in our situation, but I, I did look into it and it was very costly with chemical. Uh, but again, uh, it may be a, a tool to use to keep open areas open or just on that fringe um, if it's difficult terrain. Thank you. We'll um, we'll move on to the next question. So the next question is: Is there any tools or templates that can help with a specific benefit cost analysis for INS management? Uh, no, there's there's no specific template. I mean, if you have the book, you'll see the way it was worked through there. Um, I mean, it would it probably wouldn't be too difficult to to put a template together. I mean, it, it's only just a an Excel spreadsheet that uh, produced those those uh, figures in the booklet. So uh, it, it wouldn't be a, a huge issue to, to produce something, uh, but there's nothing that I could just, that I could say you can just pick off the shelf at the moment. Thanks, Ron. I have a couple of comments that have come through. So one comment is, the chopper roller has been successfully used near Ford's Bridge and that Tebutheron, excuse my pronunciation of that chemical, is active on turpentine and highly active on poplar box. It can be used in New South Wales successfully on fence lines, but unfortunately there is no aerial registration in New South Wales. Um, this person has stated it is unlikely that a company would fund a New South Wales permit as the active is off patent. So rolling on from that comment, I have a question about has there been any research done on aerial application of pelletised tebutheron? Um, is that a question we could address now or would you like to address that after the webinar? Oh, I, I'm not aware. It's tebutheron. Um, I'm not aware of any research on, on aerial application uh, of any herbicides, frankly, uh, on INS in New South Wales. If, if it's been done, it would have been done in Queensland. Um, and uh, Brian, are you, are you uh, sort of more familiar with what's gone on in Queensland recently? No, Ron, no, but I can just add to that to say my knowledge is that we can't use it in New South Wales. And um, yeah, probably not worth investigating the cost or anything else of it if we can't use it. Uh, it's probably one out there that I think pressure could be put on people to get some of the uh, legislation maybe changed, especially in uh, large areas. Thank you. The, the next question is who can we contact for personalised INS management advice? Well, I'd, I'd go to Brian Dunn in the first <laughs> Yeah, look, it's uh, again, if someone wants to give us a call and have a chat, quite happy to do that. Um, you know, again, that's all we can do is, is give you some advice from past treatment methods and how people have gone. But, you know, I think any action is worthwhile. You know, you've got to make a start soon. Um, otherwise, in 10 years' time, we'll be talking about this again and your paddocks may be twice as um, thick. So yeah, action straight away I think is good. But yeah, give us a call if you'd like to um, yeah, have us come out and have a look or discuss it further. Back to you, Tanisha. 
Thank you, Brian. I think that answers the next question about is LLS continuing to work in the space? So sounds like we are working in a space by we're happy to provide advice and support to people in this space on INS management. Yeah, that's correct. And look, we, we don't have any funding or any of those sorts of opportunities coming up uh, in, in the near future. Um, yeah, so even though we haven't got funding for it, we're still quite happy to uh, uh, give advice and yeah, see if we can steer people in the right direction. Thanks. Jen come through from somebody saying we need to take the right action, but they're not quite clear as to what that specific action is. So Brian or Ron, would you like to address that? I believe it would be specific to each individual property. Yeah, well, it, it, it would be. Um, you know, I think I sort of tried to make, make clear that there, there isn't a, a universal prescription that I can, uh, that I can lay down. Um, I mean, if, if somebody, if that person wanted to describe their situation to me, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, consider it further. Um, but uh, I don't know that I can, you know, be of much greater value uh, in, in, in the present, at the present time. Yeah, and I think to what I was saying before about the um, wet versus dry, uh, I was talking about uh, turpentine there. And yes, there's a different response from the wet to the dry country and, um, no, sorry, from the heavy to the light country and from wet to dry chaining. Um, so again, it's just specific to your INS species and uh, your country type. So yeah, like Ron has said in the past, it's a bit difficult to have a one set of guidelines to suit all. Thanks. Great, thank Tanisha, you, think, Ron and Brian. We have time. For, sorry. I, I I think if that person you know wants to uh, write down their particular situation, you know, I'd I'd be happy to to give it a bit of thought. I mean, uh, I don't know that I'd be able to get out there on the ground and have a look, but uh, I I can offer some some thoughts uh, together with Brian, no doubt. Great, thank you, Ron. I think we have time for one last question. So this question is, has there been any research done on the best grass, forage or perennial species that have kept INS to a minimum for the longer term? Uh, no, not, not in terms of trying to identify specific species. Uh, I mean, the fact is that you know, vigorous native grasses will be will be quite sufficient to suppress INS seedlings in in a dry summer. Um, I, I think we know from what well, we do know from uh, Graham Harrington's work um, in the uh, I think it was around the Fords Bridge area <clears throat> that uh, you know healthy stands in that case of, of woolly butt um, were quite capable of of suppressing. Uh, INS germinations over a dry summer. So, you know, I, I, I don't think we really need to put a lot of effort into trying to find, um, you know, better species. The, the, the species, the, the perennial grasses that, that will occur naturally in the Western Division are quite capable of doing the job if the, if the, uh, if the summers are dry. And, and if the summers are wet, you know, if the first summer after germination is wet, then uh, it probably doesn't matter what you've got in there. Um, the, the woody uh, seedlings will probably overtop it. And, and once they've overtopped it, then, then you know, they have the upper hand. Thank you, Ron. That, um, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. So I'd like to thank, thank everyone for attending and thank you, Ron and Brian, for presenting and sharing your knowledge today. I would ask you all to please take the time to complete today's post-webinar survey. It's a great way for us to guide future events and for you to provide feedback on today. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact myself after today's webinar and I can pass on your details to Ron or Brian. And I would like to mention that you'll get a link to the booklets that Ron mentioned today with the recording that will be sent to you within 24 hours of today's webinar. 
And Ron also mentioned the tactical grazing workshop. We are actually running one of those next week. So if you're interested in tactical grazing, please let me know and I will look to run one in your area if there's enough interest. Thank you all for attending today's webinar. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. See you.